Okay, guys, so we need to start now. Uh, I wanted to say a few words, but actually John was here last year, so I, <laughs> I, I use the same, the same thing for Roland. So I think both Roland and John think that Scalawave is awesome just because they are here again, right? So uh, John is going to tell us something more about uh, type level tips, tricks, and, and traps, OK? So uh, without any further ado, um, I leave the stage to uh, John. John Pretty. Thank you. Jen Quinn. Jen Dobry. Witamy. Nie mówię po polsku. Thank you. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and hello to everyone else. I'm a, I'm a little bit loud, aren't I? I'm, I'm intimidating myself. Let's, let's move this away a bit. There we are. Uh, welcome. So uh, the title you see up here is Type Level Tips, Tricks, and Traps, which is extremely difficult to pronounce, uh, and also sufficiently difficult to spell that it is misspelt in the program, uh, and there's a gra grammatical mistake. So in protest, I'm not going to do this talk. I will talk, well, I thought maybe I could talk about Contextual instead, which is a library that's gaining some traction for working with um, sta additional static typing on strings. But anyone who was paying attention knows that I presented this last time, so it's, it's quite bad form to do the same talk at the same, same conference two years running. So maybe I could talk about Magnolia which is uh, a library, a macro I've been working on recently, which, uh, which does type class derivation. But you'll see here, it's better, faster, and easier. But when you're making bold claims about uh, something you've written, you need to be certain that you're certain of your own facts around them uh, before claiming your library is better, faster, and easier. And if you're not certain, then you must at the very least make sure that the author of the only alternative isn't keynoting the same conference. So I'm not going to talk about Magnolia. I'm going to do an entire talk dedicated to telling you about Scala World. No, I'll, I'll give Scala World about five seconds. I think this talk would be uh, too exciting, too interesting, and too much fun. So we're not ready for that yet. Maybe in September we will be. Tickets are on sale. If you, if you want to come. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk today instead, this, this, is the, this is the last title slide, about Impromptu, a library which, um, a, a, aside from a very small minor announcement I gave up, carry on about this, this is, this is the debut for Impromptu, which is a dependently typed async library, which um, when, I, when I finally decided I was going to do this, I didn't know Roland was, uh, was, was going to be here. Uh, and I actually repeat a little bit of what, uh, what he's done with, with Akatyped. But you can compare and contrast over the, uh, uh, with, with the additional typing I've done with Impromptu versus what Roland showed us in the, in the previous talk. So there's actually only a single idea in this talk. I'm going to spend 40 minutes talking about just one uh, idea which I think is extremely interesting and, and I think can allow us to write better, safer code with less risk of failure at, uh, at runtime. What I want to do, what I want to provide to all programmers is a closer relationship between compile errors and code that will not run and successful compilation and code that will run. I want that to be, if you like, an isomorphism. If your code wasn't going to run and the compiler or any, any analyst can, can look at the code and say this, this would not run successfully or there would be race conditions, I want to translate that into a compile error, make it as hard as possible to, uh, to write code which won't run. So this is my design goal for a, uh, a, a new async library which, uh, which has recently become impromptu. And for the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll give you a very trivial example. We're going to do something quite boring. We're going to search a file to see whether it contains a certain string. And to do that, we want to read, read a file name from standard input. So we'll ask a question, say, to the user, type in a file name. And then we'll load that file from disk. And then we'll read another string from standard input, which we will then use to search the file. And we'll return true or false, depending on whether the file contains the string or not. Now, the thing to notice 
is that two and three can be done in parallel. We can be loading that file from our, our slow hard disk, or maybe even from the internet, maybe we're downloading it. We can do that while we're waiting for the users to type in their input. These, these can run in parallel. So if you, if you were to draw this as a graph, it would be a, a, a diamond with a, a single node reading the file, and then two and three here, and then moving into merging those two into, into four, where we actually combine them and, and do the, the check. So it, it's, I think, the, the easiest example I can come, out, come up with which demonstrates what, uh, what impromptu does. So I guess everybody is familiar with using futures. Anyone not familiar with futures? That was a leading question. But uh, futures allow us to um, uh, run, run things in parallel on, a, on, an, exe uh, on a, uh, an execution context. And we can define uh, the four tasks that I, that I mentioned like this. Uh, we have a future which reads the file name. This returns a string. And then we can map over that future, which means we wait until that future has finished, and then we use the result of that to do some other computation. And in this case, we don't actually use the value. When, when we're getting the search string, we don't, we don't need the value to ask, uh, ask for the next input, but we don't want to ask for the second input until we've got the first input. That, that's, that's fair enough. With the source file, when we're reading the source file, and we just use um, from the standard library get, get lines, uh, we do actually need the file name. We need that file in there. Uh, we use it to, to get the file, uh, which, is, which, is, uh, which, which is maybe more, more familiar with uh, many uses of map. And then finally, this is, the, this is the difficult or the interesting bit. We want to check whether the, source, the, the result of the source future contains the result of the search future, OK? All good so far. We use future.sequence for that, or at least in this, in this example I'm using future.sequence. What future.sequence does is takes a sequence of futures and turns it inside out into a future of a sequence. And we construct our sequence from the search future and the source future and construct a new future using future sequence. And that future will complete when both of those are finished. OK, so it's, it's this, what the code you see here is safe. It will, it will, it will run. It will work uh, reasonably consistently. But I'm a little bit concerned about this get here. What this get is doing is it's saying, I'm confident that this future, the source future, is definitely complete. And I'm happy to have an exception thrown in, in, in the circumstances where, for some reason, it's not. Likewise, this, this get here. The other, the other get, by the way, deals with uh, error handling. And I think for the remainder of the talk, I'm not going to focus at all on error handling. Um, it's sort of orthogonal to, to what I'm doing. But this, this one here is concerning, because what would happen if I missed, uh, well, missed source off here? The compiler wouldn't tell me that this get is unsafe. The compiler has no relationship between this source up here and this get here to know that this, this will actually work. And you can, you can remove that, that source from the sequence there, and it will still compile. So this is a little bit problematic for me. By the way, at the end, we just wait for the result, uh, and, and futures have this, uh, this syntax for doing that. We block until we get uh, a result from all of these. So we could maybe improve that. We could work around this, this problem I've just described by actually taking advantage of the fact it's a map. So th this, the top three lines are the same. For the map, we're actually going to use the result of that. So remember, we start with a sequence of futures, and we turn it inside out into a future of sequence. And this is the, this is the sequence we get. But we have a new problem now, because the value type of search val and the value type of source val are different types. One's an iterator of strings, and the other one is a string. And if we put them in a sequence, like if you put a mixture of types in a, in a list or, or any, any generic collection, what the compiler does is it works out the best type it can find that, will, that is suitable for all of those. And it turns out that that is object in this case. And object is not useful for doing anything, really. So we have to cast it. We have to cast it down to an iterator, and we have to cast the search down to a string, which is 
probably worse, I think, because what would happen if um, we swap search and source around? They both begin with S. You'll, you will hear me in, in the course of this, uh, this talk say source when I mean search and search when I mean source probably several times. It's confusing enough that the error could happen and we would get a class cast exception at runtime. So this is also unsatisfactory. And so this is what I think is the, um, a much better solution using, using futures. We can, uh, sorry, using a for comprehension over the futures, which are monadic. And as everyone knows, a monad is a uh, monoid in the category of endofunctors. Yeah. And monads are all about sequencing. So although we've got nice syntax here, we've got no casting, we've got uh, no blocking, and we have no unsafe gets, what we do have is no parallelism either. Because each of these happens after the previous one is complete. So we can't do search, we can't do this future here at the same time as this one here. Now, there are ways around this, and you're probably thinking of them now. You're probably thinking, well, why don't you just assign these uh, futures to a, to a pair and then add an additional line in here, which some, somehow works that out. That's possible. Uh, that's possible for an example of this size. But this is, I think, a, a, a trivial example. And in, in the real world, and I'll, I'll show you one a little bit more complicated towards the end, that becomes more and more difficult. And the syntax becomes quite ugly. And we, we find ourselves distracted by the parallelism rather than focusing on the actual, the actual work we want to do. So this is the best we've seen so far. And now I'll show you, it, it's actually slightly falling off the slide, but uh, maybe I can improve that. Maybe I can't. Um, this is the way impromptu does it. So wherever you saw future previously, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say async instead. So we're going to create an, uh, an asynchronous um, task here. We're going to read, read the file name from standard input. Async is like a future, but it's, it's lazy. It doesn't start evaluating when you create it. It starts evaluating when you ask for the future from it. Now, the next line is getting a bit more complicated because we, instead of just creating a a simple async like that one there, we're now saying after in file. What that means is we will only start this after this one has completed. Now, you're probably all distracted right now by this implicit env here, this implicit env here, and this one here. Is everyone distracted by them? So you're probably wondering why they're there. Pretend they're not there. OK? I'll, exp I'll explain later. Uh, so the, the, the task looked look very similar, apart from we, we, we're now defining what each one depends on. And uh, after actually takes var args, so it can depend on two earlier async values. And the, the code for doing the actual work where we say, does, it, does, the, uh, does the file contain the search string, looks very similar. Um, I've used parentheses here, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, by the way, this, this compiles. This compiles fine with impromptu. And you're probably thinking nothing at all special. It's just different syntax with implicit n written everywhere. So this is the same thing, but this one won't compile. This is a compile error. And the reason is that I haven't declared source as a dependency of my result async future. Source is missing, and the compile error happens here. The compiler will say, you can't access an async value which is not a declared dependency. This is exactly what we want, because we don't want to have this, uh, th this source value still downloading the file or loading the file from disk while we're trying to check whether it contains uh, the search value here. So it will only compile if it's safe to access these without blocking. OK? So this is. This is, by the way, I noticed there's no reaction from the audience. This is, this is, this is the big moment. This is the, this is the one thing. Thank you. <laughs> um, hopefully, you'll come to appreciate the significance. But uh, what, what this has allowed us to do is declare dependencies um, at the point they're used without having to think in advance of, as to where you need to define them and, and the, the actual evaluation order of the futures. All you say is what you depend on. When you're writing code in here, if you refer to something like source, you know you need to 
uh, include it as a, as a dependency there. Now, you might have noticed that async values like, like this one, we can refer to them without the parentheses or with the parentheses. Without the parentheses, we're just referring to the async value. It's, it's been assigned to a val. Uh, it doesn't start evaluating. But if we want to get the actual result out of it, then we put the parentheses there, and it will be, uh, it, it'll return the, the result. And it will return the result without blocking, because we've got these, uh, these guarantees. Now, how do I go about implementing this? And this is maybe the point at which you start to realize that this is not a talk about async at all. This is a talk about dependent types. And it's maybe a little bit more similar to my original title about uh, type level tips, tricks, and there aren't, many, there aren't many traps. I'll avoid them. But we're going to talk about using dependent types and using some advanced features of the Scala type system to implement this. So we have our async class. It's much simplified at the moment. And given an async value, you can try and get the value out of it. But I'm, I'm going to demand that you provide, or that there is an implicit env environment in scope. So this is the, this is the method definition. And there it is, that, that, that thing I told you not to, not to look at before. This is actually the environment. And we, we try to access the environment when we call apply on source and it finds this one here. So far, so good. Now, there's, there's, nothing, there's, there's nothing in here that uh, distinguishes between source and search, unfortunately. And that, that's maybe something we need to do. But first, I'm going to start thinking about what types my async class will have. Now, if you think of async as a little bit like future, Asyncs have a, a, re a return type, a value of the, uh, the a type of the value that they store. Uh, this is really simple: string, string, iterator of string, and it, it, it's whatever this um, code like this will return. So no surprises there. So we can we can give these types. That's all fine. But there's another type there which I want to use to represent, to encode, if you like, the dependencies of each async value. And um, I've just written it as triple question mark now because we're going to think about how we can encode the dependencies of an async value in its type. So what we want, if you think of a node in an async graph, it has potentially um, any number of incoming edges. It can use, it, it can refer to any number of dependent prerequisite tasks. Uh, in order to do whatever kind of computation it wants to do. And this is a bit like a set. The, it's a set of incoming edges. And what I need to do is represent this at the type level. Now, first of all, notice that we can associate every async value which is assigned to a val, as, as you saw, with a singleton type. So for every single value you assign in, in, in Scala, there is a corresponding type. There is a type which has only one instance, which is that value, and it's called a singleton type. The value merely needs to exist for that type to exist, to, to the extent that types ever exist. But the compiler is able to talk about them. So we have singleton types for every async value. And what we need to do is test whether a dependency represented maybe by that singleton type is in, is in the set, in the type level set. So the next idea is intersection types. You're probably more familiar with these than you realize. So these are uh, types that are constructed from um, some type with another type, like product with serializable, which you've probably seen at, uh, at certain, certain points. Product with serializable is the type of all things which are products and which are also serializable. And I'm going to claim that an intersection type has set-like semantics. So in, in, in Scala, the type system will consider the type A with B to be equivalent to B with A. We can reverse them. We can shuffle a larger intersection any way we like, and the compiler is able to work out that they are uh, equivalent. Um, there's an unsoundless bug in the, in, the, in, the, in the Scala type system, which means they're actually not. But we're not going to go anywhere near that unsoundless issue, so it's not a problem for us. 
Um, it, what, what I'm doing is, is safe despite that. They also deduplicate. A with A with B is the same as A with B. A with B with A is also the same as A with B. It's as if it's a set of, of the types that appear in that intersection. So we've got reordering and we've got deduplication, which is exactly what we wanted for, for this. And the observation I make is that A is a supertype of A with B, and B is a supertype of A with B. Now, if you replace supertype with is a member of, and replace, write this as a set, we have set membership in terms of subtyping. So this absolutely fundamental operation in, in set theory of checking whether an item is a, an element is a member of a set, we can actually make a correspondence between that and another absolutely fundamental operation we do in the type system all the time, almost every single line, which is subtyping. This turns out to be very convenient. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use intersection types of singleton types. I'm going to combine these two ideas together. And my async values here are going to be typed with the singleton types, or the intersection of singleton types that make up its dependencies. So by virtue of this in file being here, this, this, this value, the corresponding singleton type will appear here. Uh, likewise, it appears here for the same reason, and although it's slightly coming off the slide, um, we have search and source here, which means we have the actual, the, the, the interesting case, which is search.type with source.type. This is a type representing our dependencies, the prerequisites. So this is all very nice, apart from, well, uh, I'll, I'll attack the fact that uh, I've had to write very long and very verbose types later. But um, we have an issue we have to address, which is, which is variance. Who is a little bit uncomfortable with variance? So yeah, yeah, everyone's a little bit uncomfortable. I'm grateful for Miles putting his hand up. It's one of the first to put his hand up, in fact. Um, variance involves some number of, of bit flips in your in your head to, to to reason about it, and it's it's counting is difficult. Um, but we we're going to use variance to. Uh, to ensure that an env of uh, a type, well, the, the, the type parameter of env has the same subtyping relationship whether it's wrapped by env or not. So remember that source.type is a supertype of search.type with source.type. And if you wrap each of those in env by virtue of the covariance of env, like this, this plus here, we ensure that env of source.type is a supertype of env of search.type with source.type. So this is, this is something we need to do to make this work. Because when we, when we calculate the result in here, when we call apply on source or search, we, the compiler is saying, I'm looking for an implicit env. And uh, have I missed the definition there? Um, it, it, it looks for an implicit env of uh, source.type. When you want to apply search.type, it looks for an implicit env of search.type. And the only, the only type, well, not the only type, the, the, the best type which satisfies both those conditions is actually env of search.type with source.type, which sort of finishes somewhere on the curtain there. So this, what we've done is we've provided the implicit with exactly the type it needs to satisfy this. Okay? And remember, these, are the these come from the dependencies. One thing to notice is that we don't normally need to specify this, this env type. We don't need to say exactly what it is. This will be inferred, because once the Scala compiler has worked out the type from the, the, the var args of the first parameter block, that type is fixed. And now it's fixed, we can, we can refer to it here without it 
without it being influenced or potentially being influenced by the, the value or the, the, the lambda we provide here. So Scala is happy to type this, uh, to, to infer the types here. Now, yeah, I said before that these, all these type descriptions, this one isn't so bad, but they get worse and worse, and under there, you can't see them, but they're horrible. So, what can we do to avoid this? We want to use type inference, but what I'm doing is actually some quite complex typing. And the return type, the return type of this after method is what we need to use to help with inf inference. We need to take advantage of, uh, we, we, need, we need to, re the return type of after is what works out what these, what these types are. Uh, and this, 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 is, this is the definition of after. It has, uh, when, when you call after, these, these two type, type parameters get uh, instantiated. The dependencies comes from, this, this, is, uh, this, this parameter comes from here, so some number of async values. And the action returns the return type here. So whatever the result of that lambda is will, will end up being the return type. And it picks the best type it can find for depths. Now, if you include a load of async values in there, and ask the Scala compiler to find a suitable type for all of them, what it will do is find the, the general async type. It will lose all the specificity of its, of its parameters. And this is what we really don't want. We, we, we don't want the least upper bound of those async values. We need to somehow infer that intersection type. Contravariance to the rescue. Words you don't hear very often. We're going to introduce a new class, dependency, and we're going to make it contravariance. So this, this minus sign here is the contravariance of the dependency. Uh, it simply wraps an async value. And when I call after, I'm going to wrap each value with this with this dependency here. So I've introduced some more boilerplate to save me some boilerplate elsewhere. I mean, maybe I could write this as a method, maybe I could make it, make it shorter, but what we, what we can now do is, because D, this type here, uh, is contravariant uh, in, in, in the dependency type, when we calculate the lub, which will always happen with, uh, with, with var args if you've got more than one, when we calculate the lub of all of those, for the contravariant parameter, it inverts that lub into a greatest lower bound. And it turns out that the greatest lower bound is just the intersection type. So what it's asking for is, or what, what, we, what we use this little trick for, is to find the best type the compiler can find that is a subtype of all of these types here. So what we get is the result here. Search sort type with source type, exactly what we wanted. And all we had to do was write new dependency and specify the type there. Maybe not completely satisfactory, but we can use an implicit conversion. Implicits. Uh, are the next tool we, we reach for. And what happens with an implicit is when, when we provide a type, when we provide a value of a certain type in a position that uh, expects a different type, an incompatible type, the compiler will go and look for suitable implicit conversions that will convert from the type we've got to the type we want. Now, interestingly, we can write an implicit which converts from an async to a dependency of an async. Now, even though the type, we've, we've, uh, the type we want, the type in, uh, in for these parameters here, is dependency of some unknown parameter d, we can ask the compiler for, some, for an implicit from the type we've got to some dependency, uh, dependency of an unknown d. And the compiler goes and looks, and it finds an auto-wrap definition from the type we've got to a type 
of some dependency of a specific D, specifically this type here. And it goes and applies this to every parameter, as if by magic. And consequently, without writing anything more than this, we can get those dependencies applied to each, each one automatically. We can get the inferred type of each uh, parameter here to be different. And the result is that the, uh, the, the, the dependencies type that gets inferred is this intersection of singleton types, which is precisely what we wanted, and the syntax is as good as we could have hoped for, I think. So if you go back and look over all of the, all of the stuff that the compiler infers, it, that, that is um, almost all of it. Uh, and it's horrible and verbose. And what, what we get instead is, by, by virtue of toying with the, um, uh, the, the, the inference uh, facilities in Scala, we can get something which looks like this. I really thought I could just press the minus key and it would, oh, there we are. This, this, is, um, this is what it looks like. I say it's almost boilerplate free because we've still got these annoying implicit ends. Anyone got any ideas? Dottie. Yes, Dotty, thank you. Dotty introduces a new feature called implicit functions. And because we know that we're always going to be having this implicit env, every single lambda we write after and after, it, will have this it has this implicit environment which it needs. And Dotty provides this through implicit functions, and it allows us to move that implicit specific, or the, the definition from every single call site to just once at the definition site. And because it's an implicit, and because we have other ways of grabbing implicits without specifying them by name, we don't actually need to include the parameter at all. So when we write this in Dotty, it looks even nicer. There's no implicit, and this is, this is the entire code. And there is no more or less code than I think you would want to see uh, in, in, in this example. So this is my, um, my idealized uh, Dotty, Dotty version. Uh, it doesn't compile yet in Dotty for other reasons, but maybe we'll get there. Uh, the alternative is that implicit functions make their way into, into Scala, and then we could get the same thing. It, it's certainly not uh, anything like impossible for that to happen. And I feel like I ought to speak about the implementation. Although I, I find I'm, I'm interested in, in types, I'm interested in all, all the tricks you can do. When I write code like this, I don't write any implementations. I implement everything with triple question mark and then worry about the implementation after I've got the types compiling. But the implementation is actually so utterly trivial that I have to show you. This is almost all of the the, the code. We have a future, a lazy, lazy future inside every async, and the implementation of that is to take the dependencies, get their futures, so it recurses as necessary, and when they've all completed, so using map, we perform the action. And we give it uh, any, any environment we need, because we're, we're never going to use that environment parameter. It's there merely to guide, uh, guide compilation. And then, in, when, we, when we try to apply this, the implementation is simply to get the, uh, it, it's, it's this code I was uncomfortable with before, where I'm, I'm, I'm getting this assuming it is completed. But we can safely assume it's completed because the type system is now guaranteeing that for us. So this is it. There's nothing more to it. And um, I'll show you a slightly more real world example. This is, this is again in, in Dotty style. Uh, imagine we, we're running an HTTP server which is receiving requests, and we want to handle those requests. So we write a method which, which handles them. Here's the implementation, takes a request. Now we want to do various things asynchronously. We want to store the order in a database. We want to go off to a payment service, make the payments. Uh, we want to generate an invoice. Maybe we're, we're using LaTeX to make PDF invoices. We want to send a confirmation email. And when all of those are complete, we want to respond to the incoming request. But we want to do as much as possible in parallel. 
And we don't really want to think more than we have to about what needs to be done in what order. We simply want to say, well, for example, in order to, um, in order to send the email, we need the, the order, the payment, and the invoice. So we declare those as dependencies, and we know that when we try and access the lazy future in here, that it will go off and look at the, the, the futures defined in these earlier async tasks. And so the return type of this handle method is one final async which, uh, which sends the response to, to the request, which is some, some HTML page containing, containing the content. This is, this is very concise and elegant, and it's quite easy to see what happens. And all of these will happen by virtue of their references here. And that's all there is to it, except to finally, having, having constructed this graph, this, this handle method constructs the graph, we ask for the future, the listen method to, uh, uh, expects the future to be returned, and it, it runs the whole, um, the whole thing at, at that point. Until you, well, in, in, in the body of this method, no, no actions actually take place. So that, that, is, that, is, uh, that is it. I, um, the source code is, is on GitHub, and um, the whole thing, this is the most amazing thing about it. It's just 30 lines of code. And before I... How much of it is type um, Well, I, I showed you the implementation there. The rest is type declarations. <laughs> uh, so 28 lines. Um, I'll, I'll show you in a second. It, it's, uh, it's open source, Apache licensed. I've published a binary. That is on, uh, on Sonotype now. You can use it. You can write, write code as long as you include the implicit env, because we're still in Scala. And this is the entire source code. That, that is uh, everything I've, I've shown you today. Um, I've, I've condensed it onto fewer lines to just brag about how few lines there are there. So that, that, is, that is basically it. And I thought, can I go a bit further? Can I use these ideas to implement actors as well? Very much along the lines of what Roland has done. Uh, I'm not going to go as far as Roland with, uh, with, with, with sessions. Um, the one thing I want to do, first of all, the most important thing is, and the thing which, on the occasions when I've used Acker, the thing which caught me out most was I was frequently sending messages to actors which could not accept those methods, uh, those, those message types. So I want, I want sending a message from one actor to, a to an actor which can't accept that type, I want this to be a compile error. And uh, while I'm at it, I'm going to make the actors functional. So I will, how, how much time have I got, by the way? Does anyone know? Six minutes, okay, that's almost perfect. Oh, what did I, what did I do? I've, I've, got a, I've got a compile error. I'm, um, so there's some, there's some code over here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna compile it here. Um, I think I was, uh, yeah, let me, I, I made a quick change. There, okay, so pretend that didn't happen. So we're, we're going to, um, I, I, I knocked up while Roland was giving his talk a, a, a quick uh, couple of actors here. One is, one is called Greeter, one is called Audit. Greeta will count the number of people who, who say hello and, uh, and, and, and leave. And uh, audit will keep a log of things that happen. And the output is, is here on the left. So what, what, what happens when we, when we run this code is we, uh, it, it, it says, hello, John, you're number one. Goodbye, John, because I've just left. And um, then the logger arrives and then uh, it outputs the, uh, the, the logs here. Now, why, why does all that happen? Well, let's trace through. We define the actor here, and one thing I didn't have to do with the async values, which I do have to do with actors, is specify at least one type somewhere. Because if one actor talks to another actor, and that actor talks back to the first actor, we can't avoid a cycle in type inference. And like when you write a recursive 
definition and don't provide the type explicitly, the Scala compiler will say this is a problem. Now, with the async values, there's actually a, a very convenient correspondence between referring to something which hasn't been defined yet and uh, a cycle or, 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 or something which, which should not compile. So we can be comforted with, with the async example that if you, if you refer to something that's not yet uh, evaluated, then the, 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 the compiler will identify that there is a cycle and it won't infer the types. And in fact, you can't even write the types if you try. Uh, but with actors, uh, we, we can have them referring to each other, but we just need to specify a type explicitly. Each actor has state. The, state, the initial state is defined here, likewise an empty list here. And think of this a little bit like a, a fold. The actor is, when, whenever a message is received, the actor folds uh, over, the, uh, over the state. And I've had to invent some syntax here. Um, this is all standard Scala. There's no, there's no, uh, this, this is all uh, Im implementable as standard. But I've had to invent this syntax for referring to uh, types that we match on, because pattern matches we, we doesn't doesn't give me access to the types that are in the in the partial function. So my greeter will receive messages such as hello and goodbye. It will do some stuff, and at the end of each one, it must return the new state. The state adds one when someone says hello. Uh, it remains unchanged when someone says, uh, someone says goodbye. We also send messages to the auditor. So whenever, whenever someone says hello, we, we log that they arrived. So um, for example, by the way, this, 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 is in, this is in reverse order, but John arrived is the log we get from from sending this here. Likewise, we send the log message there. And after the first person uh, says goodbye, we dump the logs, which is why this output is appearing here. Now, if you look at how I initialize these, I, I send a hello message to the actor, and then I send a goodbye message to, to the, same, the same greeter actor. This, this is the hello. This is the goodbye. They spawn other other messages to uh, the the audit, and uh, for, for no particularly good reason. Whenever, whenever I uh, I ask the logger to to, to do a, a dump of the logs, I also send a, a I, I also ask to be greeted with with hello by the greeter. So this is this is a simple maybe maybe not not uh, not particularly real-world example of, of actors. But what I want to show you is what happens when we start breaking it. If I recompile this, if I don't, allow, if I don't accept log messages, if I, if I comment out this, this on log here, then we get compile errors. This is now a compile error. This is a compile error. I can re-enable that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I, think I, I think I'll stop there because I'm, I'm probably out of time and I got, I, got, I got the biggest applause I could hope for. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's maybe worth saying that this is the, the code for this. I, having, having worked on the async stuff first, the sim simplified async stuff first, uh, it took me an afternoon to get this working. And the actors in their limited capabilities at the moment, and they, they don't do anything near what ACCA uh, or, or ACCA's typed, typed actors will do. But uh, that, that came out as about 50 lines of code, and that is, in the, that is in the first release. And it's pretty usable. It, it appears to scale, and you can, you can start using it, maybe, um, maybe with a little bit of caution. But um, the worst case scenario is it won't let you compile when you think it should. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if it compiles, it will, it will run. So there we are. That, that, is, um, that is impromptu. Thank you.